Welcome back to our conference on climate change. My name is Jonathan, and I've been uh, given the, the really amazing uh, responsibility of working with an incredible crew of people from across the Smithsonian who have a lot to share when it comes to the topic of global climate change. And as you've noticed, each of them is approaching the topic from a different perspective. Um, we have people who are talking about biodiversity, the effect on plant life. Uh, we have people talking about art. And today, at this very next session, we will be talking about uh, the impact of climate change on animals. And we're going to be talking also about what some groups and what you might be able to do to have an impact on the situation that faces us. From impact to action, wildlife experts share data stories and responses from young people. And you're seeing on your screen Don Moore and Joe Sacco. Don is the Associate Director for Animal Care at the National Zoo. And Joe is the Associate Director of Education. Uh, two people who have a lot to uh, uh, offer when it comes to the topics. So I'll be turning the floor over to both of them. A quick reminder that we welcome your questions on the left side of the screen. As I mentioned earlier, you can send in your questions via text messaging as well to 99503 with the word chat in front of your message. And we'll look for that as we go along. So with that, allow me to turn the floor over to Joe and Don. Okay, thanks. Um, Joe, do you want to do a little bit more of an introduction? Uh, greetings. Uh, thank you, Jonathan and Don. Uh, greetings uh, to all of you. I'm the Associate Director of Education at Smithsonian's National Zoo. I'm responsible for all the educational program programming uh, from classes to two-year-olds through adults, teacher training, volunteer training, special programming for our members. Uh, it's a, National Zoo is a wonderful place to work. I have a 100-acre classroom at the National Zoo, and uh, we have uh, an additional facility in Front Royal, Virginia, that's uh, several thousand acres. Welcome to all of you. And I'm Don Moore, Associate Director of Animal Care at Smithsonian's <coughs> National Zoo, and welcome to everybody. Uh, the photo on the screen of the person in the baseball cap is me on the tundra buggy in Churchill, Manitoba, hard by the uh, icy and now kind of warmer shores of the Hudson's Bay, where polar bears come every fall, waiting for the ice to come in. I've been doing that for about uh, 10 years from the tundra buggy, a big bus on eight-foot wheels uh, that's surrounded by polar bears as they wait for the ice to come in. So I'll be speaking today about my um, experience up there and in the in the warming Arctic. So can we go to the next slide here? All righty. So you've already heard from Bert and Francisco, if you listened earlier today, about the impact of a warming climate on animals. Um, you've heard about warming effects on migratory bird patterns around the world. And Francisco talked about how some birds are arriving and nesting earlier. And I'd like to just talk a little bit about a, a pied flycatcher as an example. They're actually still arriving on time, and their insect prey is emerging earlier. So the lesson there is that climate change and global warming effects are different for different species. For polar bears, which, as I said, I've been going into the Arctic for about 10 years, um, polar bears are losing the ice habitat that is their breeding and feeding platform. It's getting uh, less in thickness and less in extent, and we'll look at that today. And warming habitats around the world are allowing uh, parasites and diseases to move their range, as Francisco said, to find new species and individual victims. And they put these previously unaffected species in danger, whether those species are trees or other plants or animals. Um, if they haven't been exposed to parasites on an evolutionary scale, then they're not um, adapted to co cope with those. So National Zoo uh, veterinarians and other scientists is studying climate change through disease surveillance at home by studying migratory birds that uh, come from South America and through North America. At our Smithsonian Impala grassland site in East Africa, we're studying quarry bustards at Smithsonian's Tropical Research Institute in Panama. And uh, also through our research efforts down in Antarctica, 
you can see a picture there of Weddell seals, and we're studying effects of uh, different domestic animal viruses and, and carnivore viruses on those Weddell seals. And we have historically long uh, blood values for these animals. So we can see that they are being impacted by uh, climate change. And we're wondering if there are um, kind of other ways that you remember that animals were, were impacted by climate change. We put that question up on the left side of your screen, just above the chat box. Um, so in what other ways are animals impacted by climate change? We have joining us from all across the globe of all different age groups. We have uh, students like Alicia, whose teacher wanted us to remind her why she should pay attention and how important this is. So Alicia, please pay attention. This is your future and your environment we're talking about. Um, so uh, we have a lot of people starting to submit their answers about the uh, impact here to animals by climate change. And this is also, for those of you who joined us with Francisco's, uh, during Francisco's session, this should also bring up a few, uh, a few trigger a few memories there. And here's a photo of one of my polar bear friends up there on the Hudson's Bay. You know, so we are talking about uh, climate change, and we will be talking about the impact on animal homes in the Arctic. But um, just for Alicia, remember all you people out there, the impact is going to be pretty hard on us also. Well, all right, let's talk a little bit about polar bears. Uh, I put the little black arrow on this slide on uh, or close to Churchill and Point Churchill where we go and, and watch these polar bears wait for the Hudson's Bay ice to come in in the fall. They have uh, about a nine-month season to go and eat the seals that they completely depend on for maintenance and also for reproduction, uh, for getting fat. And uh, during the, the summertime, these particular bears live on land and don't have access to seals. And so that summertime has been getting longer over the last 10 to 20 years with the global warming. This is one of the largest carnivore, carnivores in the world. Uh, males go up to 600 kilograms or well over 1,200 pounds. Females about 800 kilograms or uh, 400 kilograms, sorry, or over 800 pounds. They feed on the ice breeding seals, the ring seals, the bearded seals, the harp seals. They use the uh, water under the ice for their, for their food, the ice itself for haul out areas, and the snow under the ice for their uh, kind of snow caves for their kids. The polar bear has a, a diet of fat. It's the seal blubber. They basically eat through the, the skin and eat all the blubber. And as you probably know, they're followed around the the ice cap by Arctic foxes who eat the meat and the bones and everything that's left. And because polar bears basically are lipivores, they're fat eaters, and that's a term coined by my friend Andy DeRoche out at University of uh, British Columbia and chair of the polar bear specialist group, we know of exactly one other lipivore, an animal that eats specifically fat, and it happens to be a spider that feeds on cockroaches. So in the entire world, we know of two lipivores, a polar bear and a spider. And um, because they eat fat, polar bears can have up to 50% body fat. So let's talk a little bit about the Arctic marine food web. Um, this is a cartoon that Dr. DeRoche also sent to me so that I could use it today. And uh, we make the point that the Arctic food chain is like a garden upside down. If you're in the Arctic and you're looking out on the ice, what you can see is the polar bear. What you can't see is everything in the food chain, everything below the ice. So what happens is the ice forms on the surface of the Arctic Ocean, which is a big circular ocean surrounded by continents at the top of the world. And the sun penetrates the ice and helps phytoplankton to grow. The phytoplankton, which are free-floating plants, small sea plants, feed the zooplankton, which are small free-floating uh, animals like shrimp. And those then feed Arctic cod, which is a small fish about um, eight to nine inches long, which then are eaten 
by the uh, ice breeding seals and some of the seals actually eat the clams on the bed of that ocean and then those seals are eaten by the polar bear which we call the apex predator this entire system is a very short food chain but it has very high fat content uh, because it's such a rich system even though it's kind of a small system it's not a food web it's kind of a food chain polar bears at the very top and we don't really know the numbers of any of these other animals because they do live under the ice but the scientists in the arctic can count some of the polar bears um, here's the polar bear food chain looking a little bit closer and um, those little fishies over there under the the ice in that water wedge are your little uh, arctic cod that are sitting there you know, among the bubbles, eating the zooplankton, and then the seal is there uh, feeding on the Arctic cod when it can find them. And then, of course, the seal, being a mammal, not a fish, has to go uh, up into the air to breathe, so has breathing holes. And the polar bear is exquisitely adapted to sitting and waiting at these seal breathing holes, waiting for its little fat packets to come to the surface so it can grab them and eat them. Polar bears are found, again, only in the Arctic Ocean. There's a reason that polar bears don't eat penguins. It's because the penguins are from the South Pole and the polar bears are from the North Pole. They have um, about a, over a dozen uh, unique populations around the Arctic, uh, between Russia and Greenland and Norway, Canada and the United States. And we think there are about 22 to 25,000 in the world based on scientific counts over the last uh, few decades. Question about the yes. absence of the fox in the We left that off just to make it simple. There are certainly Arctic foxes. Um, uh, we kept the food chain just the, the predators and the primary producers. But of course, certainly there are scavengers. And the scavengers um, bat clean up in food chains and food webs. And so the foxes, ravens, um, those are pretty much the only two species that are uh, scavengers up there. And so we just left them out. But thanks for the question. Um, because we've never done this experiment of making the Arctic Ocean's ice go away in all of human history, we call the estimates of future warming of the Earth projections instead of predictions. In other words, since the time of the Roman Empire, the Greek city-state, the Egyptians building their pyramids, we've had stable temperatures and we've had an Arctic ice cap, not an Arctic Ocean. And so because now we're getting to an Arctic Ocean, there's great uncertainty about how much warming we're actually going to have around the entire Earth because the Arctic ice cap has been our kind of air conditioner for the planet for thousands of years. And now uh, it's not going to be, as you'll see as I... Uh, Don, okay, can I just go? stop you uh, for yeah, one sure. second? Uh, I think what I'm hearing you say is that the Arctic is kind of regulating the rest of the Earth. It sure helps. And okay. so in North America, when we're having a really warm fall and we get some of those Arctic winds, all of a sudden we have uh, some cooling. And when we watch the, the winds around uh, the northern hemisphere over the last you know, few decades or centuries when we've been doing weather data, we do find some regulation there. Thank you. Good. Uh, that, that metaphor, that idea of, of the cap being air conditioner for the earth is one that uh, will be in my mind for a while. A quick question before you leave the slide from uh, Serbia. Luis wants to know, has the population of polar bears always been around 25,000? For what period of time are we talking about? You know, it's a really good question. Um, we had, uh, until the last 20 or, or 30 years, uh, there was some kind of unregulated hunting of polar bears. Uh, remember that wildlife population studies are relatively new. And so um, the best numbers of polar bears have been gotten by statistically rigorous methods over the last uh, 30 years. Certainly there has been a warming and cooling before in 
um, five to ten thousand years uh, in increments between the the glaciations and the inner inner uh, ice age times, but um, in recent years. It's been relatively stable at 22 to 25,000, although we think that we've lost 10% or more of the polar bears based on our observations of marked bears around the, the study populations that we have. What a great question. So I wanted to talk a little bit about this uh, thing called albedo and why the Arctic and Antarctic are warming so quickly to other relative to other areas around the planet and they are warming up faster than other areas around the planet and I hope if I talk a little bit about this thing called albedo everybody will understand that a little bit better what happens is when you have ice and snow in an area which you'll know if you're a, a skier or a skater and you go out on ice or snow it really reflects the incoming sunlight and so um, as a skier, if I'm, you know, skiing on a sunny day, I get a worse sunburn than I do if I'm walking in the woods on a sunny day and or walking in a field on a sunny day because uh, a field or woods or mud will absorb more sunlight and more infrared radiation than ice and snow will. So ice and snow um, in the Arctic and in the Antarctic have been acting kind of like mirrors to the sunlight that's coming in and they've been reflecting this heat back up into the atmosphere over years and and we haven't had you know much of a greenhouse effect say in the last thousand years or so until recently and then when it when it starts melting it it creates say mud or uh, maybe taiga, the, the spruce forest moves north, and those are pretty dark trees. So the mud and the dark trees in open water, all open water is pretty dark if it's deep, they all absorb sunlight better than the snow and the ice do. So because they're absorbing this sunlight, um, there's kind of like a vortex effect, and there's more absorption of sunlight, more warming, and then you get more area of open water mud or or trees that are moving into the area and then you get more warming on top of that so you know we've had this uncertainty about global warming um, and we still have that and it's because scientists have developed um, uh, predictions based on models that maybe didn't take into account as much of the albedo effect as, as um, we're seeing now. And so there are new models. Um, scientists have taken that into account and we're explaining this really fast warming of the Arctic and the Antarctic much better. So um, we're going to run a, a video for you that was developed by Ignatius Rigger out at University of Washington. I'd like to set this up before we run it. And what you're looking at is uh, the Arctic ice cap from kind of an Arctic scientist's perspective. The, the middle of the cross is the North Pole. And then you're looking at Greenland, Russia, um, Canada, the United States, and Alaska around the outside. Remember we said the Arctic Ocean is a kind of a big round ocean surrounded by continents. And you'll see at the top left corner of this uh, video screen 9 1979. It's September of 1979. And we're going to run this uh, to about 2007. The red things are, are ice buoys and the thickness of the ice is um, either white to dark blue. The white is the thickest ice, the ice that's been there from the time of the Greeks, the Romans, the Egyptians. And the, the lighter ice is uh, out to seasonal ice. And then the dark blue is water. And what you're going to see as this video proceeds, remember that that uh, 9 September is the end of summer. So in 1979, this was the biggest retreat of the ice, but it's still a pretty big, thick ice cap. And um, then in the winter time, um, 1, 2, which would be January, February, the ice will be a greater extent, and but it'll be seasonal. And then 
and then in the summertime it'll go back down again and you'll see this breathe for about 20 years and then all of a sudden in the last 10 years it's really really taken a hit and you'll see how much ice we've lost so keep this initial image in your mind as we roll through this and here we go i hope So 1982, and in the 1980s, the ice cap was staying about the same size. Um, it would go down a little bit, and then it would expand out. Um, some of the ice was going out um, along the Straits by Greenland and into. Uh, it's uh, playing at a slightly different the, time for each person. The Atlantic. And um, so shipping, shipping lanes in the North Atlantic had uh, ice chunks uh, in them. And part of the, the criticism of, um, of kind of the 1990s was that these big ice chunks were out there in the Atlantic, but nobody was looking at this kind of space age uh, image by Dr. Rigor. And mine has stopped at 1995, so I don't know if we can keep it going. But essentially, um, this this video is available from uh, University of Washington. It's also available from Polar Bears International, and uh, you can see it on their websites. The in 2000, the ice is the white ice that's left is down in the small islands on the lower left, which is the Canadian archipelago. And so we've lost in uh, a very short period. There's there's 2005 for you. Uh, we've lost in a very very short period about 30 years. One one scientist's lifetime. Uh, the the ice that was there from the time of the Egyptians to you know just 30 years ago. Yeah. Uh, Don, it's a very powerful uh, video. We're having some technical difficulties so we weren't able to get to um, 2009 but we will have our original PowerPoint posted on the virtual uh, exhibit hall and uh, the video will be there as well and uh, as you could see from even 2005 um, if you look at the white area and again that's the old ice uh, very little of that old ice is left yep and they've got ice core data on this old ice um, so this is the polar bear habitat. This is the polar bear uh, walking, breeding, feeding platform. And you know, when an animal loses its habitat, uh, it is endangered and in danger of going extinct. So the polar bear has lost its habitat. You can see how far offshore, off the continental shelf, the 2005 ice is and it's even uh, farther now and that's why polar bears are um, are drowning and uh, yes. a quick question yes. before we leave this uh, one question really yellow lines which we can see a little bit on on this uh, 87 and 2005 and we saw at the beginning of what, what are the yellow lines? I believe dr. Rigger put those in to, to just show the ice extent for that year okay great and then there's also a, a question about the methods for measuring ice thickness. Are the buoys moving um, to with the ice flow, or are there other methods of measuring ice thickness? So the, the buoys are moving with the ice flow. And as I understand how Dr. Rigor uh, uh, measures the, art, the ice thickness, it's from x-ray images from outer space. And also, they're they're actually going out there and ice coring. But my friend Steve Amstrip, who's the U.S. expert on polar bears, tried to get out there to measure polar bears, and they couldn't land a helicopter on on the ice this last uh, this last season. So, you know, you can't just go out there anymore and uh, try to measure the thickness of the ice because it's so thin you may you may put your helicopter through the ocean. That's not a good thing. <laughs> Uh, there are a number of other questions. We're going to come back to a few of them uh, as well. Um, so we want to we want to th thank everyone. There are a few questions about 
uh, what can we do about the polar bear, which might be where you're, you're headed. That is where we're headed. Um, so polar bears don't generally swim, but because of the loss of their ice and snow habitat, we've seen them swimming more and we've seen drownings for the first time, which have been big, big news. Um, I've observed starving polar bears more often just in my uh, short 10-year period up in Churchill, and this is a female and her cubs from Churchill. She was so hungry, she was coming into the camp to try to find food, um, to drive males away, and that's a very dangerous thing to do for a female polar bear with her cubs. So it's just um, we're seeing thin bears and strange behavior and fewer bears. You can find out a lot more about um, our education efforts with polar bears by going to Apple Learning's uh, Rolling on the Tundra, and we're doing cooperative programs between Smithsonian and uh, Apple Learning, Polar Bears International, and also Jane Goodall's uh, Roots and Shoots group. So my question is, have we gone over the tipping point? And I think that's what people are doing, um, are, are asking, can we save polar bears? Um, or is it way too late? And I don't think it's too late. Uh, you have to be an optimist in this world. And we just have to all change our behavior to help turn off lights, ride or walk to work, consume less, and reduce our fuel consumption. Uh, Don, I had an opportunity to read some of the uh, participants' comments. And lots of teachers are with us today. Welcome to all of you. Um, I really appreciate the positive message that you posted here, uh, Yasmin Bailey Stewart, who teaches in New York City, uh, said that it's a challenge to have students appreciate the value of studying the environment. And um, Julia, who teaches fifth grade, not too far from where we are now at a bilingual school, is interested in the politics of climate change and was asking, what is the US doing? Um, is it too little, too late? I, I really think if this is the kind of issue that we're going to leave for governments to solve, we're going to be in trouble. So I think each of us has to uh, make a change within our own lives, and we'll uh, talk about that a little bit later. But that this is an individual as well as a, a global issue. Um, as far as Yasmin, I, although we're focusing on polar bears, we talked a little bit about how the Arctic affects the entire Earth. This affects everybody in New York City as well as uh, in the Arctic. Um, there was a, another teacher, Janine Hemmel, who teaches middle school in Portland, Oregon, who um, says that her, some of her children feel that nothing humans do will make any change in the world. And uh, that, that just isn't true. In fact, it's just the opposite. Everything we do changes the world. Well, that's right. This involves enormous social change and behavioral change by billions of people. And when you think, especially for all you teachers out there, uh, for all the billions of people on the planet, two billion of them are children. So if we can get to the children um, through the teachers, well, guess what? We can make enormous, enormous change. So then I'm pretty much done uh, with polar bears, and, and we're going to talk about actions you can take to uh, uh, reduce climate change. You can certainly save energies and, and bears by uh, turning off your lights and TV and reducing any fossil fuel consumption that you have. Uh, thanks, Don. Just some other things for uh, uh, schools to consider, uh, students, teachers to, to consider. Do, does your school use recyclable food trays? Do you, uh, Don mentioned leaving the TV on, lights on, video games, radios. When you shop, are you bringing your own recyclable bags? All of these actions make a difference. Does your family own a fuel-efficient car? Are you eating locally and green? It's uh, kind of interesting that what's good for you as an individual, eating further down the food chain, is also good for the planet because overall it uses less energy. Uh, eating locally means that foods are transported in much shorter distances. Again, using less energy has a, a direct link to climate change. I think it's really important when we're talking about the recyclable bags. You know, we all have to recognize that plastic bags are made of petroleum products just like every other plastic product we use. So whenever we're using petroleum, we're using a fossil fuel. It's not good. I have a question from the Philippines. I mean, you're uh, offering some suggestions here, and Mike wants to know, is it true that simple things can truly... 
or maybe it's a uh, statement. It is true. <laughs> I, and, I, and, I, and I agree. Um, very simple things. Uh, Don just talked about plastics. Uh, using uh, recycled, um, I'm sorry, using bottles uh, over and over again, getting those uh, metal bottles to carry your water in rather than plastic bottles makes a difference. If each of us just did something small, that would mean a huge difference as it's multiplied over and over. And just turning out the lights, the TV, everything when you leave a room. It's just a simple matter of turning off a switch, and people just don't think about it. Uh, we're going to put up a, a poll question here and ask people to vote. Um, the question is, to help with global warming, we all need to reduce our personal carbon footprint. How much lower is your personal carbon footprint if you recycle and reduce your garbage output? Go ahead and register your vote. And while you are, if we could go back to the polar bear for one second. We had a couple of questions. So sure. I want to sneak in here. Um, one question is, since there is a drop in the polar bear population, is there an increase in the seal population? Well, and again, uh, we know everything that we know or, or we think we know about the seal population, the fish population, the zooplankton population by looking at the polar bear population. So we know that um, uh, as polar bears were drowning last year and the year before, there were some seal pups drowning because their uh, snow cave layers were melting and uh, the pups can't survive in the cold ocean. So the seal populations are actually, the ice breeding seal populations are going down as the polar bear population goes down, we think. One more quick one from Heidi. Is there data that reflects how many polar bears have been drowning versus starving versus uh, experiencing other causes of death? That's a great question. Um, we don't have very many radio collared polar bears out there, which is how you would get at that question. A radio collar fits around a neck where the, the individual's head is bigger than the neck, and that is only female polar bears. A male polar bear's head and neck combination looks like a traffic cone, so they don't get marked. And so we don't know um, how many are dying, but we know that a lot of radio collared females have drowned. And so uh, we have a lot of anecdotal data. And um, recently, in the last couple of months, researchers have found polar bears that were very, very thin or uh, bodies washed up on shore. So they know it's happening. They know that they've never seen it before in uh, you know 25 or 30 years of researching polar bears, and that this is a very, very big deal that it's now happening. We're going to come back to some more polar bear questions. Let's take a look. Um, maybe Joe can walk us through the response that we got here to this. Is that the? Uh... Uh, that's the response, and it uh, looks like the majority of our participants are correct. About 2,000 pounds per year. It's a ton. Yeah, That's about a ton, ton per year. Right. Um, Samantha Bishop, who's uh, joining us from North Carolina, teaches kindergarten. I, I have some good tips for you. You were looking for some really good ideas. Uh, have recycling boxes in your classroom. Uh, use uh, reusable water bottles. Create student jobs like the recycling monitor or lights monitor. Lead students in picking up trash around the school. Uh, have plants and flowers in your classroom. Minimize paper usage. Use both sides of the paper. And I listed a couple of websites. This is not only uh, beautifying your school and making your school a better place, but it's really helping young people understand that what they do makes a difference. We have another uh, poll question for you. How many pounds of carbon emissions can you save by walking or biking most of the time instead of taking the car? Uh, by the way, I was in Portland, Oregon uh, just last week for a conference, and uh, hats off to you, Portland. I saw many of you biking to work or to school. By the way, we have an interesting point made by one of your colleagues at the zoo in the chat area uh, who mentioned that you could uh, reduce your use of petroleum-based products by using uh, alternatives for things like crayons, which are petroleum-based, and she's suggesting they're a soy alternative. So I'll let that conversation continue there in the chat as you trade crayon uh, suggestions. And uh, there you have our voters say 1,500 pounds per year to this question. And I'll go to our next slide, which uh, 
Yes, 1,500 pounds of carbon emissions per year. We have a really uh, great group out here, Jonathan. You attract only the best, Joe and Don. <laughs> <laughs> so the message is, somebody asked if you know we could really uh, save the polar bear. Somebody asked me yesterday, aren't polar bears and, and other species just going to go extinct? I think if we all change our behavior and if we all do that now, that we can bring back habitat and we can bring back uh, animals. And this particular animal has, happens to be a good polar bear friend of mine. This is Dancer, who comes to the tundra buggy area uh, every single year that, that I've been there. You can see he's an old male with scratches. And so this is uh, very, very personal for me because I happen to have very strong feelings for, for Dancer, my favorite of all polar bears in the world. And um, I think, you know, I change my behavior. And, and if it's really, really inconvenient for me to change my behavior, I just think about Dancer and I keep changing my behavior. Uh, Don, I, I want to tell you I really love the photographs too, and I know that you took most of these. I'm going to sneak in another question. Sure. Um, th this question is, we were talking about some things that each of us can do. Um, the question comes from Jacqueline. Is there any quick fix solutions for polar bears, such as fiber optic ice artificially put in for polar bear survival? You know, um, the last time there was uh, uh, some warming between the ice ages about 12,000 years ago, there was a refugium area way up there in the high Arctic, in that Arctic archipelago of islands. And that's where polar bears survived. But um, maybe we can play that video again mm -hmm. and show you how much uh, water there was in 2005. Because it's really, really disturbing. And it's about polar bears losing their habitat. And it's remember, it's not just polar bears. Everybody depends on the habitat. So maybe we could put floating plastic out there and polar bears could walk around. But they, you know, there wouldn't be phytoplankton under the plastic. There wouldn't be zooplankton. There wouldn't be Arctic cod hiding in those water wedges that are found under the, the ice. And there wouldn't be ice breeding seals. That ice was thick enough that the seals could make their dens under the snow and have their babies survive and, you know, have them survive by being hidden from the polar bears. And Arctic foxes could follow those polar bears around and so could ravens. And uh, so, you know, things things are dire, and um, there's hope only if we all change our behavior. But it's not going to turn around anytime soon. We have a number of people responding to your question uh, about solar panels uh, at their school, says Tyler. I have a few schools talking about solar panels. A few people saying that if you don't agree with the approaches used by certain products, don't buy the products. Right. Yeah, you have to think about what you buy because the more we all reduce the energy we consume and the resources we consume, uh, the better for the entire planet. And we're going to um, look at uh, some more suggestions as well. Great. And uh, hopefully you all saw we had the full-length clip, at least up until yes. 2005. Uh, 2007. Oh, 2007, excuse mm -hmm. me. So uh, okay. we'll post that to the exhibit hall for Thank you later you. as well. And we've gotten a couple of responses. So I, I just wanted to um, address a bunch of questions by putting up this website for Polar Bears International. On the website, it talks about all the stakeholders at the local Arctic level and also internationally. Uh, we need to all remember what I was just saying, that in addressing this important issue of climate change for a more sustainable planet, we're all stakeholders. And on this website, uh, teachers, there's an adventure learning program. You can find out more about polar bear science. And there's a whole box of tools for teachers. Thank you. All uh, uh, science classes involve kind, uh, some kind of uh, research project. And uh, what better research project than one about the environment? I listed one website here. Uh, Lucy Stamoya from uh, Guatemala had a comment about inquiry-based science. And uh, I am a strong believer in inquiry-based science education as well as project-based science education. Uh, the more hands-on projects where kids can experience 
uh, and uh, test their environment, the more likely they are to really understand. Uh, collecting data on local temperature variations. Uh, Don had mentioned Polar Bears International. They have a good uh, link uh, with uh, teacher resources that connect with state standards for science. Plant trees, plant different species of trees and see how they are affected by changes in uh, temperature. Read and research environmental issues. And Joe, I guess if they were planting different species of trees, a school could actually do that as a long-term experiment and see how those trees are affected by the temperature from one class to the next. That's a good point. And uh, with us today, I know we have many uh, teacher trainers, and I'd like you to consider uh, more of an inquiry-based, a project-based approach as you train teachers. Andrea Malmont from Shippensburg University and Sherry Taylor uh, from Alberta, Canada, and Chuck uh, Hankey from Alabama are all involved in training science teachers. It's um, as they, as teachers incorporate projects uh, where kids can really experience what's happening uh, in their environment and how climate change is affecting their local environment, it has an impact on their behavior. So we do have another poll question for you to consider. That question is there on the left. What, we're already hearing about some of the things you're doing at your organization, at your school, as individuals. Uh, but what are, uh, what are some of the things that your organization is involved in when it comes to concerted projects or uh, formal efforts, perhaps? Um, so go ahead and let us know what kind of projects you're involved in. Feel free to share URLs as some of you are doing. It's a great way to share ideas. Don't forget the discussion board is also a great place to go back and post your own projects. If you have websites for them or even just a description, there is a discussion area associated with Joe and Don's talk. It's right below where you logged in for it. Yeah. And as uh, some of you are uh, posting projects uh, and some of the research I've done, I've learned about some interesting projects. In uh, Sauk County, Wisconsin, a local 4-H uh, uh, is involved with tree planting and wetland seed collecting. Meadow View Elementary from Plainfield, Illinois is installing a green roof from uh, Captain Planet Foundation. Uh, we have a really wonderful program in Spokane, Washington, where they have annual youth environmental conferences. And um, they recently had their 12th annual conference in this past April. What do you use on a daily basis that requires the burning of fossil fuels? And consider everything uh, from the meals that you eat, the clothes you wear, everything that you throw away, how you get to school, how you get home, what you eat at school, how, this, how the food is packaged. What's uh, recyclable, what isn't, the utensils that you use. We mentioned lights, computers, printers, small refrigerators that use almost as much energy as large refrigerators, uh, the temperature setting that you have in your classroom, the kinds of appliances that you use. Uh, shift to environment-friendly products and or products made from recycled goods. And you know, one of the things that um, uh, Polar Bears International put out of couple of, of small uh, mini posters uh, in conjunction with Natural Resources Defense Council and Environmental Protection Agency. And we have these posted around the zoo too. But if you use a, a low energy washing machine, you can save uh, up to 450 pounds of carbon dioxide a year. And the same for energy efficient models of refrigerators and freezers, 450 pounds per year per appliance. Someone had mentioned before little uh, changes in behavior that make a huge difference. If you move the thermostat just one degree to review uh, how much would you reduce your carbon footprint? Well, if we did this throughout the United States, we would reduce our carbon emissions by hundreds of millions of pounds. And that's based on a statistic of 150 pounds per person. And we, of course, have uh, hundreds of millions of people in the United States. We're talking about one degree warmer in the summer and just one degree cooler. Thank you for everyone who's continuing to share your ideas. Uh, you can keep them going and don't forget to use the discussion area for that. We have another question though we'd like to ask you and we're going to go ahead and put that one up. That's, uh, I think you guys are interested in finding out if people are aware of some or using environmentally friendly, friendly products. We are going to go ahead and ask you that question. Um, I would, while people respond to that, 
if they can multitask. I will try to. Um, the, we had an interesting question from Vermont, uh, by the way, from Kristen, uh, excuse me, um, from Greenbelt, Maryland. How do you feel about ecotourism to visit the polar bears? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, you know, we get asked that all the time. Um, there's nothing like a close-up encounter to uh, engage people and inspire them to reduce, recycle, and reuse. So uh, we wrestle with that. And uh, we've, at Polar Bears International and through American Zoo Association, we've gotten students up there on um, uh, ecologically sustainable uh, visits. And the, the big deal is, yes, they take a jet there and they take a jet back home, but they also go out into their community as part of their project and they engage and inspire the rest of their community based on their trip to see polar bears. And so if they can use that kind of small amount of jet fuel to get up there and back, but uh, get everybody in their community on board reducing their energy use, then they'll make a big impact on the planet. It's a really good question. We continue to wrestle with it. I'm not really sure that I know what the answer is, but um, you know, if we can make a huge impact through it, then then it's a good thing. And if we can't, then it's not. <laughs> but we think that we're making a huge impact through that kind of tourism. Thank you. Um, there are some fun projects that uh, have been involved with uh, making the environment a better place. And this is one I came across with students in the Cormac Middle School in Massachusetts, Massachusetts, they designed sneakers to illustrate awareness of uh, issues surrounding their carbon footprint. And I bring that up for several reasons. One is that uh, the arts are a great way to connect with environmental issues because they tap our emotions. And when there's an emotional connection, that's what leads to action and behavior change. I also noticed uh, one of our participants, Tony uh, Russio, who teaches theater in Massachusetts, uh, uses theater to teach environmental science and is very effective. Uh, hats off to you, Tony. Chesapeake Bay Foundation uh, has some great suggestions for things that we could do on a local level. Planting trees again, you'll hear that over and over. Uh, improving your schoolyard habitat, monitoring local streams for water quality and health. Paint storm drains. Uh, the storm drains around here very often say Chesapeake Bay because that's where uh, our water goes. Adopt a stream. Keep that stream clean of trash on a regular basis. Monitor that stream. And advertise your efforts. Make sure others know about what you're doing. I also know that uh, Linda Scherf from uh, Berlin High School in New Hampshire uh, had uh, considered being part of the solution. She has a special interest in water quality and uh, asked about projects. Uh, a Developing a rain garden to catch runoff from your school is a great project for schools to be engaged in. Live by example. Uh, and I, I put some examples of different grants uh, that uh, some schools have gotten, especially in the virtual exhibit hall. Uh, in the state of Maryland, there's about 263 recognized green schools. Uh, John Poole Middle School in Poolsville, Maryland does palm water testing. Uh, they have frequent green tips on their weekly TV show. Uh, they use bluebird boxes that were manufactured by a sister green school, Forest Oak. Uh, middle school, they have a rain garden, and um, they also use solar power. And I know lots of our other participants use solar power. Uh, Valsa Galaji from India is one of our participants, and she also works with a partner school in uh, the United Kingdom that's interested in environmental initiatives and eco friendly products. So I know there's lots of great things going on. And schools have been blogging in about all the things that they've been doing at school. So thanks to all of you for actually making a difference. Thank my, you. Oh. Yes, go ahead, Joe. Uh, my uh, question to you is, is your school, do you consider your school or organization green? And if your school or organization is your household, if you're not affiliated with a school or an organization, you can respond about your own home. 
Otherwise, think about your own organization. Let's see what people have to say there. Well, it doesn't look so great. <laughs> I guess we've got some work to do. But uh, the first step, I think, is to ask us ask that question, ask ourselves that question, and then uh, take action from there. I'm seeing uh, yes, less than one fifth of you, and one third of you saying no. So let me thank Joe and Don for. Uh, showing us two sides of this issue in terms of real impact on a real specific population uh, conveyed in, in a way I think that really from, from someone who's spending a lot of time with this particular population as well which I think is really meaningful for us to see um, the and also for some real concrete steps that each of us can take both on a programmatic or a school-wide basis or even uh, as individuals as well I'm going to take uh, my license to sneak in one more uh, question here um, you know, there there are a lot of we had the question about fiber optics and snow, and there's even a few people saying, can we just put a mirror up in the the Arctic, a giant mirror to reflect anything? People are looking for a silver bullet, um, and there's a number of people saying, is it too late? Um, is this change that's going to happen by lots of people doing small things, or is there a big change? I I think this is all of us doing small things and big things and making a change in our lives in terms of what we consume and how we consume it. And um, I don't think that it's going to happen in a very short amount of time. But on the other hand, it has to. we all have to change our behavior in a very short amount of time uh, in order to help with the climate. But a technological um, advance in terms of putting a big mirror in the Arctic is not what's going to help us technological advance in terms of reducing our dependence on and use of uh, fossil fuels is. And Jonathan, you uh, bring us to that larger question, is this a local issue or a global issue? And uh, in fact, it's both. And uh, if we make changes at the local level, it will have an impact at the global level. Um, I don't know if all our participants know this, but October 24th is the International Day of Climate Action. If after this week uh, of the online conference you feel motivated, please uh, try to put uh, a project into effect before October 24th and think of ways to celebrate the International Day of Climate Change. We can do this. We could all be part of the change and uh, things will Will, things that you do will make a difference. Joe Sacco, Don Moore from the National Zoo, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank all of you, and be good stewards of the planet, please. And uh, as I said earlier, our uh, we have a much more comprehensive PowerPoint, which has information of other grant sources, as well as projects. Uh, we'll have that posted in the virtual exhibit hall. Uh, Thank you to all of you, and I hope we've given you uh, some things to think about and uh, encouraged you uh, to be engaged in this important topic. We will take a brief break of about five minutes, and when we return, we will have a live feed from CERC, the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center in Maryland, and uh, with a special presentation from Mark Haddon. Going to talk to us about what's going on in Maryland. So stay tuned for that. We'll see you all in just about five minutes.